Welcome to the Outstanding Leaders, a project of the International College of Dentists. This afternoon, we are honored to have a man that's done it all, Dr. D. Walter Cohen of Philadelphia. Walter, welcome to the program. We are a pleasure that you've been with us this afternoon, and we, we're delighted you could take time in what is a very busy schedule to be Thank with you, us. Thank you, Dick. It's great to be here. I'm honored to be here. Let's start this interview by saying that uh, you're a periodontist, yes. you're a researcher, you've been a dean, you're college president. How did you have time for that? Now, let me start at the beginning where, tell me about your early days. Tell me about your mom and dad. Tell me about your family and how you got started, uh, where the direction is. I grew up in Philadelphia. I was very fortunate that um, my parents stressed education and my dad was a dentist who graduated from Penn Dental School in 1923 and later on took his graduate work in periodontics at New York University which was the only graduate department at the time and uh, I went to public schools in Philadelphia and when I was in high school my dad uh, wanted me to see if I would like the profession and I became a plaster boy in a dental lab in Philadelphia and then when I got out of high school, I went to work for the Universal Tooth Company while I was waiting to get started at Penn. And I was fortunate I started college when I was 16 and uh, was able to almost get um, two years in and pre-dent. And in 1944, the Battle of the Bulge, where the casualties were so heavy that everybody who turned 18 went. And uh, I was very fortunate I went into the Navy and uh, went to boot camp. In fact, there were two of us that went the day I left from Philadelphia. The other one was Stan Musial, who was from Denora, Pennsylvania, and all the great athletes were going to Bainbridge at the time because they had a physical instructor school. And uh, when I got to Bainbridge and went through boot camp, I was fortunate to get into hospital core school, and my first duty station after that was the Naval Hospital at Bethesda. And there, I really didn't take the program at the dental school because I had been a laboratory technician of sorts as a plaster boy and uh, when orders came for a uh, ship assignment I was uh, then a hospital uh, corpsman and I was um, assigned to the uh, USS Tarawa which was CV-40, the Essex class mm -hmm. carrier. Went to a Newport Naval Training Station where they had pre-commissioning and then went on board ship uh, in Norfolk and uh, was on the ship uh, for about six months. We were in uh, Guantanamo and finally the war ended and I had enough points and got out and went, went to dental school finishing up my pre-dent. Now your dad was a periodontist. Yes. And did your mom, uh, was she in the workforce or is she there to? Um... No, my, my father uh, was the first periodontist in the city and my mother my father was very active in dental organizations. He was the editor of the County Dental Society Bulletin. He later became editor of the Pennsylvania Dental Society. He was the president of the Philadelphia County Dental oh, wow. and was a national president of Alpha Omega Fraternity when he was 37. And uh, my mom was uh, a great uh, companion and went with him on all the meetings and things that he was involved in. How about brothers and sisters, Walter? I have one sister, a younger sister, who is an occupational therapist, Josie, and she is uh, now at uh, Harcum College where she runs alumni relations, and she still has a small practice of occupational therapy specializing in hands, taking care of people with problems with their hands. And during those early days in Philadelphia, uh, g give me some of your impressions of... Uh, of the days through high school, and were there any uh, people that impacted other than dad? I mean, I can see right away why you are where you are. Well, uh, my dad had so many close friends and colleagues, that many people who came to our house for dinner, that it was a treat to meet uh, people like uh, Isaac Shower and Mari Masler and many of the uh, colleagues of my father's. and. I went to a Central High School, which was a wonderful school, and it, many of us say it was the best part of our education, and I was really turned on academically at that time. And then you, you went to the University of Pennsylvania once you got out of the Navy. Right. And I finished uh, my physics and then started dental school in 1946 and graduated in 1950. 
Then your, then your career started going in all sorts of directions. Um, you, you're now, of course, have ended up into the educational side and as a college president, but there were those younger days in dentistry. What did you do uh, while you're in dental school from the point of view is, it's interesting to note uh, what people's opinions of dental schools uh, was at that time. How did you perceive your experience in dental school? Well, I, I wasn't happy. We were the fir first class after World War II, and most of the people in the class were older and uh, had been through a, a great deal in the previous four or five years. And unfortunately, the faculty at the time didn't have the sensitivity to realize that uh, these were mature individuals who were probably a lot different than the classes they had had up to that point. And there were parts of dental education at that time that I would have to say were almost dehumanizing. And they would point out, look at the person on the one side or you on the other side, they may not be here next year. And I swore that if I ever was in a position to change it, I wanted to get rid of the fear that was inherent in dental education at that time. Uh, our class did well. We had some very hardworking and very bright uh, classmates, but uh, dental education wasn't as pleasant as it should have been. It wasn't as mature. You weren't a professional person in the eyes of the faculty at that time. I think you went to my dental school. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, at that point, were there some career uh, influences? Uh, in fact, is in some, some very significant people uh, that would... Uh... Well, I, uh, I was very uh, taken by uh, Dr. Appleton, who had been chairman of uh, microbiology and then became the dean during the time I was there and the professor of oral histopathology was Paul Boyle who uh, was um, a, a strong influence in my career and then in 1949 I met Henry Goldman uh, who then was um, at the Beth Israel Hospital and many people consider him one of the fathers of modern periodontics and I realized that when I finished dental school, I would like to go into periodontics and take my training with Dr. Goldman if I'd be fortunate enough, because at the time he was only selecting one postgraduate fellow. And um, I was uh, very fortunate to be uh, selected for the period of 1950 through 1951, and I took my training at the Beth Israel Hospital. And that had a tremendous impact on my life, because he became I think my father was my, my first mentor. Mm -hmm. I think Dr. Goldman was my second mentor. I always said that my late wife, Betty, was my third mentor. The, the specialty of periodontics, where, where was the perception of that at that time? Because that's been a few years ago. Yeah, uh, Dr. Goldman had written a book. He was a graduate of Harvard Dental School. He had written a book when he was less than 40 years of age, which became a classic, and uh, he was very biologically oriented. He had been influenced by Paul Boyle and Kurt Thoma at uh, Harvard, and he started this program at the Beth Israel Hospital. And of course, he had been the oral pathologist at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology when it was the Army Institute of Pathology mm -hmm. during mm -hmm. the war, and was a superb pathologist, and uh, used that uh, training and skill uh, to apply it to understanding periodontal diseases. And being in a hospital of the quality of the Beth Israel in Boston, it was a marvelous uh, integration of dental medicine in, uh, to a medical facility of, that was a Harvard teaching hospital. And then back you came to Philadelphia. Yes, I had, Dr. Goldman wanted me to stay in, in Boston, but my allegiance to my dad was such that uh, I came back to Philadelphia in 1951, and then uh, Dean Burkett, had become the dean at Penn, and he offered me the opportunity of being a half-time teacher in oral medicine. At the time, there was no department of periodontics, and in uh, oral pathology with Dr. Boyle. And uh, I began to teach half-time and practice half-time, and my uh, practice uh, was flourished very nicely, and I enjoyed teaching and began to do some research in the oral path department and realized that I... I was able to also turn students on to periodontics as part of oral medicine. 
And by 1953, Dr. Goldman was offering a one-week uh, postgraduate course at Penn. We did this together. And uh, Dr. Burkett approached him about starting a two-year postdoctoral program, one year at Penn because the Graduate School of Medicine had a very strong basic science program where they had uh, programs in oral surgery and in orthodontics, and they wanted to add periodontics to that list. And uh, then we uh, began a program that had the second year at the Beth Israel Hospital, uh, and Dr. Goldman was chairman of the Department of Periodontics in the Graduate School of Medicine. I had the responsibility for the first year, and a uh, number of the faculty at Penn, uh, Dr. Amsterdam and um, Jack Alloy and many others really gave of themselves to train our students and uh, we started off with the first class in 1955 and over the last 40-some uh, years uh, trained uh, many hundreds of periodontists and eventually we separated the two programs because Dr. Goldman found that it, it would probably be better to have the full two years in Boston so students wouldn't have to move and then we had the full two years at uh, Penn in the uh, 1960s. So now you were the first, one of the first chairmen of the Department of Periodontology at uh, Penn. Yes. What Professor. happened, yeah. um, I was offered a position at the University of Washington School of Dentistry and it was very attractive. It was, it was an excellent school. Dr. Sol Schluger had gone out there and um, I was then ready to go into full-time academics but I was teaching a clinical subject and I didn't want to give up practice. And at Penn, if you were full-time, you weren't allowed to practice. So Dean Burkett said to me, look, let me see if we can change the rules and have it as it is in medicine, where you have one day a week to practice or 10 hours a week and the rest of the time you're full-time at the school. Well, in 1962, he was able to uh, accomplish that so that uh, I was able to go full-time as chairman, and he said, I'm going to make periodontics a separate department out of oral medicine, uh, not being just a division, because he said, I don't know who's going to follow me, and they may not be inclined to do that, and I want you to have a full department. So in 1962, I became the chairman of the uh, department of, newly created Department of Periodontics. And then... You, you, you're going to have an opportunity to think about what dental school did to you, and you became dean in 1972? I became dean in 1972, okay. right. In 1969, I became uh, dean, uh, associate dean for academic affairs. Right. And then uh, one of the graduates of uh, Penn Dental School was Jim English, and he caught me at an IEDR meeting and said, I want you to do me a favor. If you're ever invited by the search committee at Buffalo that's looking for a new dean, I want you to say you'll come up and at least look at the school. Well, I was invited, and I did go, and I was very turned on by what he had accomplished there in a 10-year period from 1960 to 1970. And um, I, I was about to consider an invitation from President Martin Meyerson at Buffalo to go there as dean. The provost at Penn got a hold of me and said, I want you to stay at Penn. He said, uh, Buffalo will never be in your lifetime what Penn <laughs> is now. I'll never forget him saying that. So I stayed, and fortunately, President Meyerson moved to Penn. People think I recruited him. <laughs> and uh, I became uh, the candidate of the search committee, in, and in December of 1971, I was made dean-designate, and Dr. Burkett stepped down uh, in 1972, and on July 1st of 72, I became the dean. And during that time, it was significant because you did remember your days as a dental student, and you were very early in the concept of, a, of altering dental education. Uh, yes. Tell us about that, because I think that's sig well, very significant. Well, I was uh, always fascinated by the fact that dental schools had, many of them had wonderful members of the faculty, but the students never saw them do anything. And I thought to myself, why don't we do what medicine has done and have the student be a preceptee and the faculty member being a preceptor? And I always use as an example, if somebody were trained by DeBakey, obviously they not only saw him operate, but they assisted him. 
and work their way up uh, in, from uh, third year resident all the way up to first year resident where they were first assist. I said, why aren't we doing this in dentistry? So we began to look at the curriculum at Penn and say, what does society need? And we felt that what American society needed was a highly competent generalist. And we thought that we could change the educational system so that you didn't have requirements that you had to do X number of certain procedures, but that you had to take care of a family of patients. And so we tested a model with uh, two groups. We took um, 20 juniors and 20 seniors and put them in what we call general practice groups, where they didn't have to move around from the operative to the periodontic to the prosthodontic clinic. They stayed together for the full two years. And the faculty that taught them also were very, very well-rounded, highly competent generalists, and helped them with procedures. So it wasn't unusual to have a faculty member do something with a student assisting, and then they switched. The student would do it with a faculty member assisting. So they got to see things that they weren't getting in the, old educa the traditional educational system. Well, we tried that, and it went so well in the pilot study that the student body came to see me and said, they're getting a better education than we are, and we're paying the same tuition. I said, all right, let's see what we can do. And I said, either put all of us in this new program or stop it. Well, one thing we learned, if you're going to go to that type of a model, you can't have a 1 to 10 faculty-student ratio. It has to be 1 to 5. The faculty can handle a certain number. but it was going to mean either we doubled the faculty or half the student body. Our faculty at a retreat decided we're going to cut the class in half from 160 to 80. And that was the way we would accomplish putting everybody in these uh, general practice groups. Well, we went down to the university administration and we said we've come up with a very, uh, uh, what we thought was innovative plan and we want your support. Well, when they looked at the fact that we were going to cut the school in half, when at the time there was a perception there might be a shortage of dentists, and we had been given money for new facilities from the federal government, which said you're going to keep your class size at 160, the university said, no way. And they said, you only tested the last two years. So fortunately, Robert Dunlop was one of the uh, three co-chairs of the Board of Trustees, and he was on the foundation, uh, the Pew Charitable Trust. And he said, we're going to get you a grant to test this whole concept for four years. And so uh, the Pew Foundation gave us almost $2 million. And we set up three basic models. One was to have a faculty-based practice where we had students plugged in from year one through year four for clinic. We had a, mo and that had uh, private patients and uh, university employees as its patient base. Then we had uh, the model, uh, we called that model B. Model A was to take the patients who came into the school and we also put the students in uh, this model, including a one-year uh, postdoctoral internship or residency program in general practice. And then we had the traditional model, which was the one I was describing earlier. We evaluated this with the People at the Wharton School looking at it very, very critically. The trustees were very impressed with what we were doing. And at the end of uh, 1980 or 81, uh, they, the school said, OK, you can now proceed with cutting the school in half and going to this new model of education. This was called the Pennsylvania Experiment. And uh, it was a fascinating uh, experience to see students starting in year one, plugged into a faculty-based private practice. And in fact, I, uh, one of the um, uh, wonderful things that we did was to publish this book, Educating the Dentist of the Future, the Pennsylvania Experiment. And this was all made possible through the Pew Charitable Trust. And uh, the Pew uh, Trust eventually got involved in helping dental schools around the country. And this was their first venture into uh, dental education. So that was uh, one of the ways that we changed dental education. The other thing was that I wanted the students to be treated as uneducated colleagues, that they were our colleagues from day one and our job was to educate them. And 
we decided that we have to know the students outside of the school. So we had faculty student tennis matches, softball games, hardball games, picnics, and every year I had the entire senior class to my home uh, for dinner. And it really changed the whole mood of the educational process. And I was very, very pleased, and I think students were very, very grateful for that. Well, I commend you for remembering what school was like and did something about it and made it better. And that's I was fortunate. I ha we had a great faculty. And of course, one of the things, in 1956, 57, Dr. Amsterdam and I started the periodontal prosthesis program, which was a three-year program. And many people said, well, what you're doing is training super generalists. Well, it became the farm system for the faculty. When those <laughs> young people finished, I hired them, and they became group leaders in this model because they were able to do almost all phases of dentistry, and it was wonderful for the students to be exposed to them as preceptors. Mm -hmm. That's what I can tell you that I took one of your courses that you put on at Georgetown in 1964, and I enjoyed it and remembered that you and Dr. Amsterdam uh, uh, tremendously. Now, once you made such an impact on the dental school, I guess your talents were really noticed, and uh, the sequence uh, changed a little bit uh, to uh, moving up the line, so to speak, from dean to uh, a little higher on the educational standards. Well, what happened, um, going back to the end of my, I was dean from 72 to 1983. And you were appointed for a seven-year term and then reevaluated and uh, reviewed and uh, then given the opportunity of a second five-year appointment because it was clear all the things you want to do you can't do in the first seven years and I was fortunate to be given a second five-year appointment. Well, in the second period, um, we had a lot of exciting things happening at Penn that I'd like to mention to you. One is the school was celebrating its centennial. The school was opened in uh, 1878, so in 1978 we celebrated the 100th anniversary. And Penn had a very rich history. Um, we had a number of very distinguished graduates through the years, and it was a school that attracted dentists from all around the world because many people who even had dental degrees wanted to get a degree from the University of Pennsylvania. And when they went back to their home country, they frequently put that on their uh, sign that they were a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. Well, in 1978, we celebrated the 100th anniversary. First of all, we had a, we commissioned uh, Milton Asbell, who's a dental historian, to do a book on the history of the school. And uh, after this was done, uh, we had a series of international symposia on different subjects in dentistry. And we went to France uh, to have a Franco-American Congress. And uh, in addition, we had a special convocation where we gave honorary degrees to individuals such as Louis Grossman, considered the father of modern endodontics, Henry Goldman is the father of modern periodontics, um, uh, to uh, Wilton Krogman, the anthropologist who came from uh, Case Western Reserve, and to uh, uh, some others uh, who had very illustrious careers. And one of the reasons we went to France is a fascinating story because the man who left his fortune to build Penn Dental School was a Philadelphian by the name of Thomas Evans. And uh, Dr. Evans uh, grew up in Philadelphia before there was a dental school, the first dental school being in Baltimore in 1840. Evans uh, practiced in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. One day was giving a table clinic on gold foil at the Franklin Institute, and a, a physician by the name of Dr. Clark was admiring his work and asked him if he'd like to go to France because there was a practice that was looking for an associate. Dr. Evans and his wife sailed for Paris in 1849, and that practice, Dr. Brewster's practice, took care of Louis Napoleon. He was a dentist to the royal court. One day, the emperor had a dental problem, and Dr. Brewster was ill. Dr. Evans took the call, and he did such a good job that Louis Napoleon said, you're going to be the royal dentist from then on. Well, Dr. Evans was such an unusual person 
that he not only became the dentist to the royalty of France, but to all of Europe except the Habsburgs, and was very creative. He was the one who brought uh, vulcanite to Europe for dentures. He uh, also brought over the individuals who developed uh, anesthesia to expose the dental and medical community. He started the first English-speaking newspaper. He also played a very important role because the French were thinking of coming into the Civil War on the side of the South. And uh, <laughs> the emperor wasn't sure what to do, so he sent Dr. Evans. Evans met with President Lincoln, and the president said, keep the French out of the Civil War. Well, while Dr. Evans was here, he visited the Civil War battlefields, and he always was very interested in what happened to the war wounded. He was devastated at the Crimean War at seeing the number that didn't survive. He visited General Grant, and he bought an Army field hospital and sent it back to his home in France, in Paris. During the Franco-Prussian War, the French soldiers that were treated in the hospital that he set up on his grounds survived better than those in the French hospitals, and they found out it was because the flaps in the American field hospital were open and airborne infections weren't going from one bed to another. And uh, in that war, uh, the emperor was captured in the Battle of Sedan, and the empress, Eugenie, who was very close with Dr. Evans, came to his house in the morning of September 4th, 1870, and he took her in his carriage to the Normandy coast, and she sailed and went into exile. Well, when Dr. Evans passed away, he left his entire fortune to build Penn Dental School on the site of his family house. And that's why it is at 40th, 40th and Spruce. Spruce. That's where in the northwest corner. Well, part of his will stipulated that there should be an, a museum attached to the school. And in that museum, he placed his dental instruments. He had a marvelous Bible collection, artifacts, and also the carriage in which the Empress Eugenie escaped. When I was a dental student, I went into that. It was only open one day a year. It was open on Alumni Day. And I went into the uh, museum, and I saw this beautiful writing table. And inlaid in the table were photographs of Nicholas and Alexandra, uh, who was then the czar, and their children. Uh, Evans had taken care of the czar, and uh, this was re he received this as a gift. When I became dean, I wanted to find that table. Well, they had, when the school had expanded with class size, they had to take over the museum area and everything was put in the warehouse. I took a curator from the art museum with me. We went to the warehouse. We spent a day and a half going through everything and found the table, which was badly warped. But we also saw this lovely painting of flowers in a brioche. And I said, look at this, Joe. It's signed Manet. And he said, well, you know that Evans had some paintings that were signed but weren't authentic, and that was true. The Canalettos were the school of Canaletto. I said, but I like this, and I took it back to my office and I hung it. And we said, we better accession this collection, and we invited Christie's down from New York. They came into my office when they were looking at everything, and they said, what's that? And I said, well, I've been told that it's not a true Manet, it's a fake. They didn't accept that. Oh, they invited my. Anne Hansen down from Yale, and she said, that's a Manet. Where's the warehouse? I said, why do you want to go there? She says, I read his will in French. He had three Manet paintings. And she went to the warehouse and found a second one, Flowers in a Crystal Vase. I later learned that Manet painted 12 paintings of flowers he needed to pay his medical bills and uh, had his leg amputated and passed away in the early 1880s. The third one apparently went to the lawyer that settled his estate in lieu of a fee and is now in the Rockefeller collection. Well, here we're sitting with two Manet paintings we could no longer hang on the walls of the dental school. And so we went to the trustees of the university and asked them if we could deaccession these. They said if the orphan's court would permit this, they would approve. Well, fortunately, Judge, Judge Charles Klein was sitting and he had been chairman of the Board of Trustees at Temple and knew the problems of private universities, and he allowed us to offer them. They were auctioned in November of 1983 at Christie's. The flowers in a brioche brought $1.1 million, and the other one brought a million dollars. And that my successor, Jan Linda, had a marvelous legacy to use uh, as an endowment. This whole story 
was written up in a book that we commissioned by Gerald Carson. It's called The Dentist and the Empress. Um, I wanted to make this into a documentary, either a, a television series like Masterpiece Theater, because it has so many wonderful ingredients. And it was uh, actually a piece of history. But uh, the other reason I had was I thought that it would be very nice to have a dentist portrayed as Dr. Evans was, a diplomat, a, uh, also a great, uh, very skillful in, uh, surgeon. And um, I had several people in Hollywood look at the story. Finally, one producer was very much interested, and he said, but Dr. Evans will not be a dentist in our I said, then you can't have it. I said, my goal is to raise the image of our profession by letting them know some of the distinguished people we've had. But uh, this was then uh, written up in American Heritage magazine. Well, that was almost the highlight of my deanship, going through an experience like that. Oh, that's fantastic. And then um, I did move on. I, I finished my deanship. I stayed a year at Dr. Lindy's request. And then I took a sabbatical at UCSF. Uh, John Green invited me to be a presidential scholar. And while I was there, I got an invitation from the Medical College of Pennsylvania to be a candidate for the presidency of that school. That had started in Philadelphia in 1850 as the first medical school in the world to educate women. It was known as the Female Medical College and then became Women's Medical College and went co-ed in 1970. And then they dropped the name Women's. It was the Medical College of Pennsylvania. I became very much involved with the search process and was fascinated, and I was very grateful that I was appointed to president in 1986. So I left the University of Pennsylvania and went across town to the Medical College of Pennsylvania as its president. Before we continue to learn the saga as you progress uh, even further, uh, let's just take a quick break. Sure. Walter, we have you as the president uh, of the Medical College now, and, and let me just, I don't want to miss any of these things because I think it's extremely important. I want to just go down some of the honors that you've, you've uh, well deserved, and, and I want to read them because uh, there's so many, but uh, you have uh, honorary degrees from the University of Athens, Louis Pasteur in Strasbourg, uh, University of Detroit, uh, Boston University, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and many, many service awards and things throughout uh, your career, all well deserved. Are there any of those that really particularly stand out? I know they're great honors for you, but there might be something special that you'd like to relate to us on some of those awards? Uh, well, I was very fortunate. Uh, I was really uh, recognized and something that I had never anticipated happening, and uh, each one was special. Uh, in its own right. I guess um, the Hebrew University uh, was something that was also meant a great deal to me because during uh, the 1960s and 70s, when that the dental school got started in Jerusalem at the Hebrew University, it was really um, the Hadassah Hebrew University School of Dental Medicine founded by Alpha Omega Fraternity. Uh, I was uh, helpful in trying to get their faculty to the United States to be trained at the graduate mm -hmm. level. And we had an agreement between the University of Pennsylvania and the Hebrew University, and many of the faculty who are now chair people there and the deans were trained at Penn. And uh, so that was a, a very uh, wonderful recognition. and. Uh, I have been on their board of International Board of Governors uh, since uh, 1970, and I'm very proud to be so closely affiliated with the school. And there's, there's something more recently that's occurred that maybe we could interject here that I know is special to you. Yes, one of the wonderful things that's happened is that um, in order to help dental education in the Middle East, a Middle East Center for Dental Education was created in Jerusalem as part of the dental school uh, in the Hadassah Medical Center. And uh, its purpose was to help dentists in various countries in the Middle East get more experience and training. 
The first, the school was dedicated, this center was dedicated on June 1st, 1997, and I was tremendously honored by having them uh, do it in my name. And the first class came in 1998, and they, uh, the student body included, these were all graduate dentists. There were six from the Palestinian Authority, three Jordanians, uh, a Turk and a Cypriot, there's a class there right now in 1999 that has um, three from Morocco, one from Egypt, and uh, also from Jordan and from the Palestinian Authority. And we feel that not only are we helping the oral health care of the people of the Middle East, but we're helping to bridge the peace by oh, people to people Fantastic. working closely together. So for me, this is a wonderful uh, opportunity and uh, Dr. Adam Stadfoltz, who's the dean, has done a wonderful job in raising funds for this, and uh, uh, it's something that's that's very special to me. Well, I, I must agree that uh, we're going to pull cultures together by doing this, and we're going to pull countries in peace to do this. Guns aren't going to win it, and we're delighted. Now, we haven't we haven't touched on your family, and I know it was very important to you. Um, tell me about your your wife who passed away. I know several years ago, and your daughters. And, uh... I uh, was fortunate. I met Betty when uh, met her actually in uh, June of 1944. Uh, I was uh, almost 18. She was uh, 16, and uh, we fell in love. And uh, then when I went in the Navy and came back and started dental school, she graduated from the University of Pennsylvania as an elementary school teacher in 1949. Uh, we uh, were married in December of 1948 when I was a dental student, and she was a teacher in the Philadelphia public school system. Then when we moved to Boston for my training with Henry Goldman, uh, she became a teacher in uh, Lynn, Massachusetts, and uh, then we came back to Philadelphia and uh, raised a beautiful family. We had three daughters. Uh, Betty was a very unusual woman. Uh, she was, uh, ve had tremendous insight. She was uh, very warm, uh, loved people. People loved her. And um, she uh, did a number of uh, wonderful volunteer things. She ran a senior citizens um, uh, campus for continuing education at the uh, uh, Jewish Wise in Philadelphia. She also worked with handicapped youngsters, uh, disabled youngsters. She was very gifted in music and was able to reach them through the piano and things like that. And a lot of that was transferred to my daughters. I have three daughters. Um, the oldest one, Jane, is uh, married and has three children. Uh, her oldest is graduating college this year from Cedar Crest and going on to psychology. Uh, middle one, Lauren is at Drew, and my uh, grandson Michael is a uh, freshman at George School. Uh, Amy, my middle daughter, uh, is still single. She lives in Philadelphia. And my daughter Joanne is um, a psychologist, and she was married last year and uh, lives in Allentown. Her uh, responsibilities are at the Lehigh Valley Medical Center in family medicine, and that's where she met her husband, who was a resident there. And uh, fortunately, my father lived uh, a very full life and passed away uh, last uh, June at the age of 96. But he was um, very vital. Uh, we played, he played tennis till he was uh, 92, was written up in, sports, in one of the uh, tennis magazines. In fact, we had a four generational tennis match. He played with my daughter, I played with my granddaughter, and the best thing was we split sets. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, tragically, Betty uh, developed diabetes with her last pregnancy and developed all the complications of diabetes and uh, passed away on March 13, 1992. And uh, it, it was been a major loss to our family as well as to society in Philadelphia. But we were, she was a wonderful hostess, just to give you an idea, when we were entertaining dental students at our home, she would invite them and, and uh, break the class up into groups of 70, but she cooked all the food herself. Wow. 
And the one thing she didn't realize until the first time she did it is the most undernourished group of students, <laughs> our dental students, they went through that food like locusts. <laughs> and she realized that she had to come up with a strategy to do that. And, but we had many wonderful people stay with us. One who I'll never forget, uh, who used to come to Philadelphia to lecture to the students was Harry Sisher, the anatomist. And Dr. Sisher would come to Philadelphia on Friday, loved to go to bookbinders, he loved lobster, and then Saturday we'd take him to the Philadelphia Orchestra. And he, being educated in Vienna, he was a brilliant man, uh, he was, knew his music, and I'll never forget one night sitting at the concert, they were playing Vivaldi, and he says to me, they're playing too fast. Oh. So afterwards, we go backstage to meet Gene Ormandy, who had been a patient of Dr. Amsterdam's and myself, and his father had been a dentist in Vienna. And uh, Ormandy sees Sisher coming to him. He says, is this guy looking for a job? I said, Gene, I said, he's an anatomist. He said, he's a cellist. He recognized him. Harry had played in the string quartet in Ormandy's first wife's home, and oh, he wow. recognized him. Well. Harry would lecture to the students, and then he told a wonderful story that uh, I'll never forget. And you know, Harry was Harry and Peter Wyman were the ones who uh, diagnosed Freud's oral cancer, and he had been a very successful oral surgeon in Vienna. He told a story of how he was part of the anatomy department, and I had the opportunity of interviewing him, similar to what you're doing today, when Penn was trying to collect videotapes of distinguished individuals who wouldn't be known to the students personally, but they could look at the tape. Well, I remember Lou Grossman interviewed Dr. Ivey. I had the privilege of interviewing Harry Sisher, and he told the story of how when he left Vienna in 1938, he was standing on the platform, and an SS man came up to him and said, what's in your back? And there were two canvases. And he said, you're not allowed to take art out of Austria. His superior had been a patient of Harry's, and he said, let him go. Mm -hmm. Well, Harry had two paintings that were done by Egon Schiele, who was a famous Austrian Impressionist, and he had taken out Schiele's third molars, and Schiele died in the flu epidemic of World War I. When Harry passed away, those paintings were sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars and became an endowment to support the Harry Sisher Lecture, which Alpha Omega Fraternity does uh, every year. But it was uh, so wonderful having the opportunity of, of hearing his, his life story on videotape. He used to say every morning he got up and said, Heil Hitler. If it weren't for Hitler, he would never have gotten to the United States. And that was the part, best part of his life. <laughs> well, now you've had, I love to listen to the history portion of it. And I'm sorry we don't have more time to do that. But sometime I'm coming to Philadelphia, we're going to, I'd love to hear more stories. Uh, tell me, now, I, I know that you're uh, Chancellor Emeritus of Hanneman, and uh, I'm not quite sure that, relate what happened in that area and how they got named and what happened. What there. happened was in 19, uh, 1987, 1988, we became part of the Allegheny Health System. And uh, our students started going to Allegheny General in Pittsburgh for part of their medical education. And it was a very successful program, and uh, we acquired a number of hospitals, St. Christopher's Hospital for Children, um, the Graduate Hospital, and then in 1993, the opportunity to merge two medical schools occurred. Hahnemann, which was the uh, home of uh, homeopathic medicine, mm -hmm. and the Medical College of Pennsylvania came together and became the Medical College of Pennsylvania and Hahnemann Univer University School of Medicine, MCPHU, and of course the next day the students had sweatshirts with McFoo on them, <laughs> so <laughs> we knew that there would have to be a name change, and uh, <laughs> that became Allegheny uh, University. Uh, recently, we went through a lot of the problems that are impacting on almost every academic health center in the United States today as a result of a number of decisions that have been made with the Balanced Budget Act. And um, we did not uh, survive as the part of the, as the Allegheny system. The medical school survived, and it's now operated by Drexel University, and it's known as MCP Hahnemann University School of Medicine. And we are graduating this year the first class of the merged medical schools. This oh. is four years now. 
the, the hospitals were bought by a for-profit, by Tenet, and they're operating the eight hospitals that were part of the system. I'm Chancellor Emeritus, and I'm staying there as a volunteer, helping them with a number of projects. Being that MCP was the first medical school to educate women, we've done certain things to carry on that heritage. For example, women haven't been rising in medical education to chairs and deanships at the same rate that men have. There's really been a glass ceiling. So three or four years ago, we started an executive leadership program for women in academic medicine. And naturally, I encourage them to start considering a part of the 35 fellows they take to take some from dental education. So we now take four from dental education who are associate professors or above, and about 30 from medical education. And they come to Philadelphia for three sessions, 10 days in September. They meet with their deans at the AAMC, and then 10 days in April. Mm -hmm. And so far, it's been a wonderful program in helping women ascend to more senior positions. We also have initiated an Institute for Women's Health, and I'm very active with that. And we've endowed a chair in my wife's memory, the first endowed chair in women's health in the world. So I'm having fun doing those sorts of things now as a volunteer. And I'm also very much involved with um, another organization, CareLift International, which takes surplus hospital equipment and supplies and ships it to third world countries. And much of their work has been with uh, former Soviet Union countries, especially Moldova, Kyrgyzstan. And now we have an educational component where those physicians are coming to the United States to get additional training. So uh, I'm having a lot of fun as emeritus. You don't have time to, to be the president anymore. I understand, uh, however, that you received their outstanding award here just most recently. Yes. Well-deserved because you really are one of the help of the founders of that organization. And, and I know it's appreciated uh, internationally when people get the skills not only to uh, run the operation or the, uh, the categories of various instruments and various pieces of equipment, but to be able to take care of them and maintain them is very important. Otherwise, they would be put into landfill. Yeah, and that's and, what happened uh, for many so years. So from an environmental standpoint, yes. it's great for our country, and the people who are receiving it are so grateful. Yes. I George mean, Soros and his foundation have supported, uh, for the last five years, CareLift International, and now we're getting AID money from the federal government. Uh, let's, let's shift again, because you have so many opportunities that I want to ask you about. Um, your special love, of course, was periodontics, and you are a diplomat in American uh, Board Periodontics, and you were a director of the board, and you held most of those positions, did you not, in, uh, in the boards? Yes. And, of course, being a mentor for many, many of the people that are now boarded. Um, and you got some of the awards from the American Board and the American Association. And uh, Are there any of those particular um, uh, situations that were special. I, there's so many that could be, I understand, but well, maybe something. Yeah, there something. was one. Unfortunately, in the early 1960s, um, there were a group of periodontists who were dissatisfied with the parent body, the American Academy of Periodontology, and they split off and started the American Society of Periodontists. They wanted a group of only specialists. And uh, there was a lot of tension between the two groups. Uh, when I became president of the American Society of Periodontists in 1967, and Perry Ratcliffe was president of the American Academy of Periodontology, we said, we've got to bring these two groups together. And so we, we had a series of meetings, most of them at the O'Hare Airport in Chicago, over a period of a year. And we had two merger committees, and we actually were able to bring the two groups back together and I felt very, very good about having accomplished that. And both of us, Perry and myself, were recognized uh, for that uh, activity. Periodontics. What are the, what's going to happen in periodontics? What are the changes going to occur? If I said, where will periodontics be in 2020 as a futurist thinker? Give me some comments on what th that may be. Well, one thing that I, I am delighted is happening, because I said it from day one, and, and you and I went through dental school at a time when uh, I think there was much more emphasis on restorative dentistry and the treatment of dental caries than there was on periodontal disease. 
I believe that periodontics should be as important a part of every general practice as the treatment of dental caries. And I think we're seeing that happen now as a result of the changes in dental education and generalists are now recognizing more periodontal disease, they're treating it, and in many instances treating the uh, less severe types, and I think the role of the specialist will be for the very advanced cases. But what I see happening is really the result of research. I think one of the great things this country has going for it is National Institutes of Health. And the National Institute of Dental and, now Dental and Craniofacial Research has supported some very, very important research, which is pointing out that periodontal diseases may also be affected by systemic problems, such as diabetes and other systemic problems uh, that a patient may have. But in addition, periodontal disease may influence the risk that a patient has for certain systemic problems, such as cardiovascular disease. We know low birth weight in women can uh, cause a preterm ab abortion sometimes. Uh, also, the relationship of periodontal disease and diabetes. So I see that as we're moving forward, that I think there's going to be a much closer relationship between our dental and medical colleagues working more closely together. I've always said that I think the average dentist knows more about medicine than the average physician knows about yeah, dentistry. Yeah. And yet, a, a physician will take a tongue blade and look right past the mouth. And that's a void in medical education, which I, I tried to correct a little bit at our school. I'm not sure I was successful. But I think one of the things that I envision happening more than it is now is that based on research, we're going to have a much more of a biologic basis to our practices. I foresee that with biotech, the dentist will be able to very easily, with a prick of a finger and one drop of blood, be able to determine a patient's blood sugar. We'll be able to do microbiology testing in our offices and know what pathogens are there. I also feel that there's going to be much more of a pharmaceutical basis for practice. I think pharmacology hasn't been an area that has been as um, important in the past, but I think with what we're learning today about uh, the oral flora and the drugs that we're going to be using, and now that we have drug delivery systems that can be taken right to a pocket, uh, that we're going to see a uh, tremendous change in the way periodontics is delivered. I think more of it will be done by generalists. The specialists will be doing the more advanced cases. I think medicine and dentistry are going to work much closer together by the year 2020, I hope. And um, I think with the refinements that are going on with um, uh, implants and many other things that are now part of our armamentarium, there probably will be no need for people to become edentulists. And I think we see that trend already. The 1990 census showed that fewer Americans had mm -hmm. lost all their teeth in than in 1980. And 1980 was better than 1970. I hope 2000 is even better than 1990. So I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future of the, the discipline, and I think it's going to be uh, much more pervasive. And I think it's wonderful because I know you're on the council of the NIDCR now. Yes. Um, since they've renamed it. So you have some impact on, on maybe giving direction in that area. And I know that uh, Harold Slafkin certainly is in agreement with those kind of... Uh, He's encouraged things. us to start yes. a friends group, yes. the Friends of NIDCR, to let the public know what's going on in research. Yes. Because yes. I think the public today is very much interested in, in medical and dental research with all the lay articles that mm -hmm. appear in uh, publications. And that's what the friends group is trying to do. Now, if I'm a young kid, Philadelphia High School, and I run upon you, and they say, hey, he's a dentist, and I say, doctor, uh, I'm thinking of dentistry. What, what advice would you give me? Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> I say, you know, I, I still, I used to go out to Penn, even when I was at MCP, uh, the admissions office had me come out to talk to students who were considering dentistry applicants, and uh, I was, and I still am, very bullish about the future of our profession. Uh, first of all, at Penn, uh, you have a very interesting opportunity. You can take combined programs, DMD, MD. Uh, you have uh, a DMD and an MBA in the Wharton School. 
There are those who take a DMD and a master's in education. There are uh, some who have taken a DMD PhD. So you have a series of tracks, like uh, small schools within a larger school. I think that uh, dentistry is a wonderful profession. I, um, I encourage young people to consider it. And uh, I think that um, one of the things I think will happen is we'll see more students taking more postdoctoral training, taking a, a residency when they finish it, either in general dentistry or mm -hmm. one of the specialties. Because I think it's very hard to educate in four years an individual that will need the skills which I say are comparable to both an internist and a surgeon in medicine, and they have four years plus another five to do it, and we only have four, and that's why I think that a year postdoctoral will be a minimum that we'll need. But I'm, I'm worried, you know, with the closure of six dental schools, whether or not there will be a shortage of dentists in the, the year 2000 and beyond. So I'm, I'm telling bright young people to seriously consider dentistry. And I think that's been uh, uh, proven by the, the dental student pool that's coming around. They say it's much more uh, difficult to get into dental school than it yes. was uh, five, seven, eight, ten years ago. It, that's right. Uh, I think uh, with six schools closing and with more applicants, it is uh, much more uh, difficult. And uh, I was glad to see a new school start in Florida at Nova University. And I learned at the University of Nevada starting a new dental school in Las Vegas. You know, I, there was a period of time I didn't think I'd live to see a new dental school start. So yes. I'm, I'm glad to see that happening. We, we need to uh, have more faculty trained. And uh, I, th I think the profession has a, a very bright future. There's, you're still so active in doing everything, and yet you've done most of the things. You've certainly done it in dental education. You've done it in medical education. You've done it in your specialty. What's happening right now? You've got some other things. I know you've written several hundred articles. You've, been, you've written 25 books. You've contributed to our dental literature beyond belief. What's still left on the platter? Well, I, I'm the editor-in-chief of the Compendium for Continuing Education in Dentistry, and that's now in its 20th year, and that's, that's a lot of fun, too. Uh, and trying to bring to the profession some of the exciting things that are happening. I want to have more time to play some tennis. Uh, that I hope to be, I'm now I'm doing a little bit more. And uh, I'm, I'm involved. I have a, a home away from Philadelphia in Coronado, California, which is a magnificent area, and I'd like to spend more time there. So I'd like to relax a little bit, but uh, right now we're working on two new books. One's on periodontal medicine, and the other is updating the book with Bob Janko and Lou Rose, the one that Henry Goldman started, called Contemporary Periodontics. So uh, my plate is full, but the pressures are, are not as bad as they were. And, of course, there's some grandchildren that require some... Uh Oh yeah, Grandpa I, time. I go to all Michael's tennis matches. He's a jock. He plays soccer, and I'm I'm trying to get to all those matches. And when my two granddaughters were playing tennis for schools, I and softball, I was there too. But I yeah, I'd like to be able to spend more time with them because they're they're great children and grandchildren. Now one of the one of the questions that I like to routinely ask, just because I think it shows insight into some of the motivations and the energies and the things that we have. What, what do you want to be remembered for? If somebody said to you, uh, tell me how D. Walter Cohen should be remembered. Um, tough, tough question sometimes, but uh, how would you respond to that? Well, I'd like to believe that I had an impact on my profession and that I was helpful to a lot of people who needed help from my family on, and uh, I'm, I think that that would be a wonderful recognition. I, I was very grateful for having been educated the way I was, and uh, I look at the University of Pennsylvania as sacred ground, and uh, I want to see that school flourish. I think I lived through a golden era of, mm -hmm. of dentistry, yeah. and and medicine, and I hope it will continue because I want to be the beneficiary of good medical care uh, as I'm now a senior citizen. But uh, 
And that's how I'd like to be remembered. I, I also would like very much to be remembered as a, a good father, a good husband, a good grandfather, maybe even someday a great grandfather. Well, if you follow your dad's footsteps, you can count on that. If I got those genes. That's right. Good stock. <laughs> I'll be lucky. So periodontics has been very fortunate that you've had major impacts on it. Thank you. Uh, medical education is very important, uh, very uh, pleased that you have given some of your energies to them. Dentistry, we're very pleased that you were one of us. Uh, I want to thank you for your impact on the youth, on your creativeness. You think out of the box, which is not all that common anymore, and it's important to what dental education and education as a group is. And we're so pleased that you've taken time to come down from Philadelphia. I know you're still seeing patients, uh, which is sort of your first love, have come down to uh, be part of this. You truly are an outstanding leader in dentistry. Thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be part of it. I think what you're doing for the International College is just great, and uh, I applaud it. And I'm looking forward to even getting a chance to see some of your other interviews with uh, leaders in the, our profession. Walter, thank you so much for taking this, this precious time that you've, you have to uh, come down here and be part of this. You are truly an outstanding leader in dentistry and the International College is delighted that you're part of our series. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's a great honor for me to be here. I appreciate it. Um.